Never before has mankind faced so many questions, so much anxiety. Sometimes our problems seem so big, the questions so complex, we don't even want to ask. But as we look at all the unsettling changes happening throughout the world, it's hard not to ask. Where is mankind headed? Just like a human. Fight off disease. Yet it's a satellite. Is the Earth sending us a wake-up call? Is there objective truth? Does anyone hold the answers to our longing and despair? Muhammad the Prophet, arguably the most... Ocean. Reverend Graham. There I is from somewhere within us. Where is that somewhere? Is this the end of the age. There's not just one set of morals and that people should agree to abide by a certain set of laws so that their morals can be modified, but morals can be different. I mean, um, the law should be just a basic guideline to keep people from killing one another and harming one another. I think there's more of like a moral awakening where we're starting to question the things that have been handed down to us traditionally. And um, I think we're just trying to look for like what is right or wrong. and. I think a lot of times we come to the conclusion that there is no right or wrong. I don't think there's any more absolute. Um, there's the only the only real thing I think that maybe hold, should hold true for all people is the golden rule. Just like if just do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. I mean that's that's pretty much it. And I really don't think people are very moral at all. There's one Mother Teresa. And there's I mean there's not much more than that. Hi, I'm Bill Gallatin, and as we look at the world today, we see a world filled with question. Where are we headed? With all this scientific knowledge and all the immorality, are there moral absolutes? Is there a God? And if there is a God, is He a God of love? Why so much hurt and pain? And if there is a God, how can we know that He actually exists and He's willing to reveal Himself to mankind? my opinion, I don't think there is an ultimate truth. Our ultimate truths, I believe, are in ourselves. Um, everybody, everybody has it inside them. It's just a matter of listening to yourself. I used to believe in God when I was younger. I, I, I believed in all the stories. I, I believed in all the rules and the commandments when I was, I was raised Catholic. But then I began to think about things more philosophically, more in depth. And there were just so many questions that I couldn't answer. So it got to the point where I, I don't really know if there are any answers, and, and you can't deny and you can't confirm either. One of the ways we believe that God has revealed himself to mankind is through the Bible. His revelation, it's so unique from other writings. One of the things that's so exciting about the Bible is prophecy. And the Word of God is 100% accurate concerning prophecy. We would like to show you one example of fulfilled prophecy. One of the most remarkable prophecies in the entire Bible occurs in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. The angel Gabriel predicts the precise day 
that Jesus was to present himself as a king some five centuries later. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, Gabriel says to Daniel, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah the King, shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. These are sixty-nine weeks of years, and the ancient calendars used three hundred and sixty-day years. And so what Gabriel is saying is that there will be 173,880 days between the commandment to the Messiah the King. Now the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem was given on March 14th to 445 BC. This is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2. The only time that Jesus permitted himself to be presented as a king was on the day we call the triumphal entry, which occurred on April 6th, 32 AD. From March 14th, 445 BC to April 6, 32 AD turns out to be 173,880 days exactly. All of this was translated into Greek three centuries before Christ was born. And it remains as an incredible evidence to this very day that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. This numeric prophecy is so amazing that skeptics concluded that the book of Daniel must have been written after the time of Christ. But thanks to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, we know for certain that Daniel was written several centuries before the time of Jesus. This prophecy is thoroughly documented in Sir Robert Anderson's classic work, The Coming Prince, but we need not look at ancient history to substantiate Bible prophecy, only our evening news. We believe that we are in the countdown to eternity now. We also believe that you can see Bible prophecy being fulfilled before your very eyes as you watch the evening news every night of the week, world events that are taking place. We also believe that the Bible speaks of these things emphatically. We're going to look at five areas in the next hour that speak of these very things. And we'll let you be the judge. Is God trying to warn the world? When the disciples came to Jesus on the Mount of Olives, and they asked him for signs of the end of the age, he said that there would be earthquakes in various places, there would be famines, and there would be pestilences. Of course, we see that there are major earthquakes that are increasing at an alarming rate in the last few years. Earthquakes of great magnitude. Of course, in the earlier years, people say, well, they have always had earthquakes. True. but. We are now seeing an increase in major earthquakes and thus we need to realize that these earthquakes that are shaking the world are a part of the whole prophetic scheme. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 8.0 or greater on the Richter scale are classified as great by the USGS. These are enormous quakes and if we chart the frequency of these great quakes during the last 30 years we note a significant increase. However, due to the relatively short period of accurate tracking, we are not able to establish conclusive trends, but we can say for certain that this generation is witnessing great earthquakes. When one looks at a geophysical map of the Earth, it, it appears like planet Earth is a hard-boiled egg that's been dropped on the floor too many times. There are many different plates called tectonic plates that tend to move one alongside of the other. And it's along these areas of movement, the tectonic plate lines, that a major part of the earthquake activity occurs. And it's also interesting to note that it's along these areas where the majority of the world's populations are located. And when we look to the scriptural account in the future, when the Bible tells us that the cities will fall, it's interesting to note that these major cities are located along these tectonic plate lines. My biggest concern is when I hear about the earthquakes increasing and when I look back many years ago I can't recall that many happening. I think natural disaster, I mean for every century there's like tons of them so you can't 
do anything about it. It's natural. Why you, that's why you say natural. I think the Earth is trying to tell us to wake up um, as far as with the ozone layer. It's trying to say how it may because we're just totally depleting the whole entire Earth. And one of these days we're going to be basically out of luck and none of us are going to be alive because all the trees are going to be gone, the water's going to be polluted, and we're all going to be dead. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 18 we read, the nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. God knew that man, left unchecked in his selfishness and greed, would eventually destroy the earth. And we watch as man continues to ravage the environment, giving no concern for the future generation. It is a matter of fact that this generation has done more to destroy planet earth than any generation before. Consider one statistic. According to Al Gore in his book Earth in the Balance, we are exponentially destroying thousands of animal, bird, and fish species each year. This destructive trend began during our current generation. We're seeing some uh, catastrophic environmental effects in this country with wetland loss and topsoil loss. Scientists know very well today that atmospheric carbon dioxide is increasing very significantly. We know with certainty that the burning of fossil fuels is causing significant damage to the Earth's biosphere. By the time we get into the middle of the next century, a, a magnitude of heat wave or a drought that we might have only experienced once in the 20th century, we might be experiencing once every 10 years. This generation is witnessing tremendous environmental destruction, not due to population growth, but rather to a selfish and gluttonous society that has polluted our water, air, and land, all under the banner of progress and advancement. One of the concerns that we have with the depletion of the ozone layer is that we know that ultraviolet radiation increases and that ultraviolet radiation actually causes skin cancer. And it's interesting, in, according to the Bible, in the book of Revelation, that the Bible talks about sores breaking out on the flesh of people. So certainly it's a possibility that this very scenario that's taking place is preparing us for something which is yet to come. Of course, if there were a major exchange of nuclear uh, weapons, uh, this would dramatically decrease the ozone blanket that protects and shields the earth and it would be even more dangerous for people to have any exposure to the sun. Already we are having skin cancers and so many problems that have developed because of the increased radiation now, but it's going to increase even more according to the prophecies in the book of Revelation. International initiative is needed to seek new solutions for ozone depletion and global warming and acid rain. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the air has increased by over 10% since 1958 and by nearly 25% since the Industrial Revolution. Without ozone in our atmosphere, I would probably need a sunscreen protection factor of 500 and probably even that would not be enough. Concerning the very last days, we read in Revelation chapter 16, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Without the ozone layer protecting us, we would literally be scorched. Add to that the continued trend toward global warming and the greenhouse effect, and it's not difficult to see how this prophecy might soon be fulfilled. One of the things that concerns people today is to see the erratic changes that are taking place in weather. Almost every day when we turn on the television or read the newspapers, we find that something is taking place in the world where there is a great catastrophe occurring. These are exactly the kinds of things that Jesus talked about, the warning signs which would indicate that the time of his return was soon. Several prophetic references are made that imply an increase in chaotic weather in the last days. Jesus said, 
For in those days there will be tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of creation. And the Apostle Paul writes that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs, eagerly awaiting the redemption. Just as a woman's birth pangs increase in frequency and strength as the time of delivery draws near, so too, the Bible tells us, the creation will groan and labor with increased frequency. Even the Apostle John in the book of Revelation writes of noises, thunderings, lightnings, earthquakes, hail and fire during earth's final days. The following quote was taken from the December 1994 issue of World Watch. A collection of press reports compiled by the environmental group Greenpeace from six continents between 1990 and 1994 displays a remarkable litany of the highest floods, longest droughts, most severe wildfires, and worst heat waves ever recorded. They go on to say that since the late 80s, hurricanes have struck various parts of the world with alarming frequency. Among the many prophecies that Jesus gave, the signs of the last days, his disciples said, Master, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the world and so forth? And he laid it out for them. And among them was famine and pestilence. Uh, and there's an estimated 5 to 20 million people who die of starvation each year. As far as pestilence is concerned, I mean, everybody knows about AIDS. That's an amazing virus that has struck in the last days. We are reading constantly of the tremendous famines that are gripping different areas of the world and along with those of course the viruses, the HIV and many different viruses that we have not really found yet the answer for. So these are all signs of the soon return of Jesus Christ. We've just seen the devastating effects of the environment. Earthquake, famine, pestilence, the depletion of the ozone. You may say it's easy to predict these things. I could predict an earthquake and quite possibly the paper would have it in its edition tomorrow. But can you possibly explain the increased rapidity of these things all at once worldwide? Now we'll explore technology. How could possibly 4,000 years ago a prophet described so implicitly the technology is taking place worldwide today if it didn't exist then. Among the prophecies in Daniel, of course, in the last days, he very clearly specifies the last days, knowledge will increase and many will run to and fro and I do an awful lot of traveling probably 150,000 miles a year I can tell you I think of it every time I go into an airport and I can remember when it wasn't like this it's amazing you go into an airport millions and millions of people running to and fro I mean I'm off to Europe I was just the last couple of months I've been in South America and South Africa both uh, it's astonishing running to and fro exactly as the Bible said and knowledge will increase. I mean, you look at a computer and think what's happening. The explosion of knowledge on the internet, it's exponential. Uh, it's beyond what anybody could have ever imagined. And the increase of knowledge is exactly as the Bible foretold. According to the prophet Daniel, whose words were recorded some 2,500 years ago, in the last days, we would expect a time when people would travel to and fro, literally around the world, and knowledge would increase. There would be an explosion of information. Today, as we look at the information age in which we live, we see that the words of Daniel are being fulfilled before our very eyes. It's interesting that in the days of David or Abraham, uh, we communicated with uh, handwritten messages. We traveled at the speed of horseback and we clothed ourselves with an agrarian economy. You can go all the way through history to George Washington, who was communicated with written messages, he traveled at the speed of horseback, and he clothed himself with an agrarian economy. And here in just a short time, we now <laughs> communicate at the speed of light, we travel at the speed of sound, 
and we create the very atoms and molecules that we desire for synthetic fabrics. It's incredible to realize the speed at which technology has enriched our culture from a technological point of view. As we watch the explosion of technology and knowledge, as well as the transportation and communication revolution, we wonder, how could the prophet Daniel have predicted this 2,500 years ago? Technologically, we've come so far in, in our advances in what we're doing that it's impossible not to see us going even farther, even if, even if it does cause setbacks. And scientists even said, uh, I believe uh, in general human knowledge, we know maybe about 50 more times more than we did, like, uh, I believe it was a century ago, something like that. So, I mean, we're exploding. Well, with communication as it's developed, I mean, now we can know what's going on over across the world within two seconds. hundred years ago, you couldn't do that. You know, right now, our community is a global community. Communications, you know, you can call anywhere around the world. You can get on a computer, go anywhere around the world. That's very important. Technology is just increasing as a whole. As you see less and less cash carried around, more of the cards, the uh, checking, the internet buying at least, and uh, you know, cash will soon be obsolete. In Revelation chapter 13 we read, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. We are told that the final method of exchange will not be with money, but will be done with an assigned mark that is put upon the right hand or the forehead of a person. Now with modern technology, not only do we see this as a potential, it is happening today. It's interesting that in our day and age, there is a technology emerging that Hitler or Stalin or any world dictator would dream of, and that is the electronic mechanisms by which one can control all commerce within a nation or perhaps even the whole world by cashless transactions with barcodes, with implantable chips, and what have you. Just recently, I took my cat to the vet uh, for a surgical operation, and uh, the vet asked me if I would be interested in having him identified by having a silicon chip implanted in the tissue of his flesh. All of these things that are happening technologically fit into what the scriptures say will take place in the last days when no man, woman, or child will be able to buy or sell unless they have a particular mark. Uh, is it possible that an identification chip implanted in the tissues of the flesh could be the means that will be used? People often wonder, are we really in the last days? I mean, what is this talk about the last days? There are a number of signs that the Bible gives that really identify our generation as the first one that you could say is in the last of the last days. This thing is about to wind up. One of them we find in Revelation 13, where the Bible says a man will arise who will control the world. Now you've got to have a lot of technology to control the world, and part of what he controls is all banking and commerce. You couldn't have done this in the past. You couldn't have even imagined doing this in the past. And somebody's coming, and he's going to control the world, all banking and all commerce, and we have the technology to do it today, technology that was never even dreamed of in the past. Jesus, speaking of the last days, said, And this gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. When we consider that 2,000 years ago, many nations, including the Americas, were not yet discovered, it is remarkable that Jesus made such a shocking declaration. Only since the 1980s has the fulfillment of this prophecy been possible. Through the deployment of global communication satellites and other communication technology, the gospel is indeed being preached to every nation. It is interesting in the book of Revelation how John saw an angel flying through the midst of the heaven 
having the everlasting gospel and he is proclaiming this gospel to all the world. Now it isn't too far-fetched uh, to look at the satellite network that we have established for worldwide communication and realize now that we can communicate worldwide through these satellites that are flying through the midst of heaven whereby a man who controlled the world could guide and govern the activities of the world as well as the gospel being preached to all nations and to all people through these satellite networks. It is interesting that the Bible tells us that there will be two witnesses that God will send and they will be slain in Jerusalem and the whole world will see their bodies lying in the streets of Jerusalem. This again would have been an impossibility if we had not had the worldwide communication systems through satellites where an event can happen in Jerusalem and we can be sitting in our living rooms and watching that event take place. And yet the prophecy as far-fetched as it seemed is now a very practical reality. There are just so many prophecies about the last days that nobody could have dreamed of. And one of them, uh, in Revelation 13, uh, it says this false prophet will come along, the second man, the assistant to the Antichrist, who backs him and who does miracles and so forth. And one of the things that he does, he sets up an image to the beast. And he makes this image talk. <laughs> uh, again, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, you, you couldn't have dreamed how that might happen. But today we have a whole science of robotics that is developing so rapidly. I mean, I've talked with some of these people and it's mind-boggling uh, what they're able to do. But to even dream this up 2,000 years ago? No, that's prophecy. We're seeing it fulfilled. This is God inspiring men to write these things. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, we read, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. It is this generation that has witnessed the birth of human-like robots, bionics, and genetic engineering. Many religions already worship images, and Hollywood has paved the way for our acceptance of human-like machines. So we see that the technology exists today and that our society is being conditioned to worship human-like images. Jesus gave his disciples a confidential briefing on his second coming, which is recorded in Matthew 24. And in that briefing, he pointed out that there would come great tribulation such as the world had not seen to that time nor ever would see again. In fact, he said, unless those days be shortened, there would no flesh be saved. It's interesting, the technology to make good that prediction didn't exist until our day. If you talked in these terms in the period of the Roman Empire, or if you talked in these terms, say, even in the time of the Civil War, the technology to wipe out the entire world just wasn't a realistic projection. And yet today, our technology has caught up to those prophecies. Every political leader on the planet Earth makes his decisions under the cloud of the possibility of triggering a global nuclear war that could indeed destroy all flesh on the planet Earth. This is Zechariah 14:12, written 2,500 years ago by the prophet Zechariah. Quote, their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet, their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths." Unquote. I mean, what is he talking about? You couldn't have imagined it 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 100 years ago. This has got to be nuclear weapons. This is exactly what nuclear weapons do. Uh, you know what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, Arafat makes no bones about it. This is not peace. This is another way of waging war, get some territory inside of Israel to destroy them, affect the ultimate conclusion, Hitler's final solution, wipe them out. Uh, Daniel 8 verse 20 says of the Antichrist, through peace he will destroy many. And finally, he will lead the armies of the world against Israel 
and Israel is not going to go down in flames without using their ultimate weapon. They have nuclear weapons, we all know that, uh, and they're going to use them. A nuclear exchange will begin in the Middle East. This is exactly what Zechariah 14:12 is talking about. I don't think you can doubt it. When I had an inside briefing at NATO headquarters in Brussels, our ambassador to NATO and our assistant secretary of defense for NATO admitted they believe a nuclear event in the Middle East is a certainty. It's just a matter of time. The Bible predicts the moral state of mankind at the end of the age. Are we witnessing these very things? Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, that in the last days many would come in his name, proclaiming that they were the Christ, and would deceive many. As I've traveled around the world in the past several years, I've actually encountered people who are following leaders who proclaim that they are the Christ. And this is not just happening in one or two countries, this is happening worldwide. For example, while I was speaking in Moscow, an individual jumped up, interrupted the meeting, and said that what I was telling them about the Bible wasn't true, that they were following the Messiah, the true Messiah, and what he was telling them was the truth, and that the people should follow that message rather than the Bible. There was an itinerant preacher, ex-carpenter, had never been outside of the little tiny country of Israel, and he dared to say, in the last days, many will come in my name. They're not going to call themselves Buddha. They're not going to call themselves Confucius. They're going to call themselves the Christ. That was pretty audacious. And yet we've got all kinds of people today who claim to be Jesus Christ. I'm God. You people that interviewed this gentleman today, I don't think you knew who you interviewed, but you interviewed God. Their lives cut short by a madman claiming to be God the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a great master, like our master is today. The Word made flesh, as the Bible puts it. Jesus himself warned us that in the last days many would come claiming to be Christ and Messiah. The landscape today is literally crawling with individuals claiming to be Christ, and the Eastern gurus are right on the top of the list. We have seen so many people today who are making claims to being the Messiah. The latest being Farrakhan, who has just announced that he is the modern day Messiah. And many are being deceived. Jesus said, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise. They'll show great signs and wonders and deceive, if possible, even the elect. There are so many today in the New Age movement who are claiming to be the messiahs or claiming to be channeling the wisdom of the messiahs for these days. There is the Shirley MacLaine declaring that she is God. It's an amazing thing to me, again, the lies that men will believe once they've rejected the truth. The words of Christ are being fulfilled before our eyes. These are the signs of the last days, according to Jesus. Over the past several decades, I have been following the pattern in society today where people are incredibly interested in the metaphysical, mystical, occultic dimension. And this is something that is literally happening in every nation around the world. Today, throughout the world, the concept is that God is everything because people have embraced an Eastern metaphysical worldview. They're turning to yoga, to meditation, out-of-body experiences, a belief in crystal consciousness. The ideas that we have considered as pagan in the past are being embraced today as the new spirituality and literally being embraced around the world. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. You know, I've traveled around the world interviewing people uh, who've been on drugs, uh, psychedelics, practicing yoga, under hypnosis. Uh, they're about 
a couple hundred ways to reach an altered state of consciousness. In a normal state of consciousness, your spirit operates your brain. In an altered state, you've loosened that connection, allowing another spirit to interpose itself, tick off the neurons in your brain, creating a, a universe of illusion. It talks about they will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. One of the big things today is channeling, communication with spirit beings. Uh, it's in the business world. And as, as I said, I've traveled around the world interviewing people, and I can tell you this, there is a commonality of the information that comes to them. They all get the same revelation from these spirit entities. Paul talked about the doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that would be involved in a deception which would also occur in the name of Christianity. He talked about many people that uh, would lead people astray, and this was what we see taking place. One of the greatest deceptions that is occurring in our time is happening in the name of Christianity as people are embracing a form of Christianity based on extra-biblical experiences. bringing a child into this environment. Do you think this is good for him? I know this is good for him. Uh, you know, the Bible says bring that child up in the way it should go. This is the way. There was something else completely controlling my body. All kinds of strange things are happening in the name of Christianity. We see the rise of satanic worship, of the satanic cults. We hear it with the musicians. We see it invading the culture of the youth today and we see the young people doing such horrible things unthinkable things because they are being drawn into these satanic cults why could they be drawn into these things because they have been held back from the truth of the gospel because their parents haven't shared with them what God's truth is. We have an epidemic of young people participating in some strata of Satanism. And I would take a portion of the blood or the body and drink it or eat it. All religions are coming around to Satanism. We're in the uh, very throes of a new Satanic age. The evidence is all around us. All we have to do is look at it. Shemham Barash. Shemham Barash. There is this fascination for the occult because they do not have the truth of God in their heart. Never before have we seen such an explosion of fortune telling, hypnotism, psychics, magicians, and dungeons and dragons and these kinds of things that we see in our world today. And I've tried a few different things, witchcraft and Krishna and stuff like that. I'm free and open, but I believe, like Rob, that gods were just invented to help give you a reason why to live because you don't know the answers why you're here. I think we are become, just be, totally becoming more tolerant. Um, crime and uh, things that people do in society is, is dropping the morals and it's making us more tolerant. Less people are going to church, there's a decline in moral values, ethical values, uh, again attributed to uh, parental control. We as adults, uh, we have a tendency to say one thing and we do another, but we expect for kids to do exactly what we tell them when we're showing them something totally different. Uh, other words, uh, do as I say and not as I do. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. 
This generation has watched the explosion of pornography and the dramatic increase in abortion on demand worldwide. We as a generation are lovers of pleasure as we give lip service to God. One example of our unholy generation is the explosion of child prostitution. According to World Watch, child prostitution worldwide is skyrocketing. In Thailand alone, there are an estimated 800,000 child prostitutes, most under the age of 16. Or consider the fact that the legalization of abortion became widespread in the 1960s. According to Planned Parenthood, 50 million babies are aborted each year worldwide. In other words, this generation is slaughtering 137,000 helpless babies every single day. Certainly, this is an unloving, brutal generation. Jesus declared, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It is no surprise that in the times of Noah that the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. As we listen to the news and hear of the vicious crimes being committed around the globe, regrettably, we know that this prophecy is also being fulfilled. Vicious, brutal, disgusting, horrible. Pick a word. After four decades of steadily rising crime rates, a six-fold increase in armed robbery and aggravated assault, a tripling in the number of rapes, a doubling of the murder rate, the question is, why? The number of teenagers who kill has more than doubled since 1985. That's the bad news. The really bad news is that the worst is yet to come. One of the things that almost everyone observes today is the violence, the terrorism, the immorality that's taking place literally around the world. And people are asking the question, what is going on? Why is this happening? What is happening to human behavior? Well, according to the book of Romans, chapter 1, we can easily understand because the Bible tells us that when man rejects God as the Creator, then we can expect to see man headed down a pathway to depravity. When there's no God, man is not accountable to God. There are no morals, there are no values, and man can make up his own rules. Jesus said, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And in Genesis 13, 13, which refers to the days of Lot, we read, But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful. Today, perversion and sensual pleasure are not only tolerated, but quite often even flaunted. But Jesus tells us that in the midst of this perversion and wickedness, that Sodom was prosperous, and there was a false sense of peace. And today, as a whole, our society is more prosperous than any previous generation, yet our wickedness continues its downward spiral. According to U.S. News and World Report, Americans spent about $8 billion on pornography in 1996. That is more than Americans spent in 1996 on the rock music industry or on all Hollywood movies combined. As we look out over our moral and social landscape, we must conclude that the time of the end is near. Israel, here's a nation whose entire history has been foretold by God's prophets. If you'd like to know what time it is on God's clock, look to the nation Israel. Israel is the key to prophecy. If you want proof of the Bible, look at the Jew. The Lord had promised the Jews that if they would turn from him, he would turn from them, and they would be dispersed throughout all the world. This, we know, took place. But the amazing, miraculous thing is that though they went for almost 2,000 years without a homeland, 
yet they maintained their national identity. This is something that is totally unparalleled in man's history. No other nation has been able to maintain their national identity for more than 300 years without a homeland. God not only preserved the national identity of the Jews, but he promised that in the last days, he would regather them back into their homeland. In Ezekiel chapter 37, we read, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side, and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. Amazingly, this generation has watched the fulfillment of this prophecy. Even today, thousands of Jews continue to regather back to the nation of Israel, a nation that has lain in ruin for nearly 2,000 years. The Bible talks about Israel being regathered in the land. That's old news. And on May 14th of 1948, the state of Israel was, re, uh, was uh, uh, reestablished. The Bible says they'd regained biblical Jerusalem. In June of 1967, they regained the old city, the biblical Jerusalem. I'm going to preserve you as an identifiable ethnic national group of people because in the last days, I'm going to bring you back into your land. 1948, he brought them back to their land. And they've been increasingly returning to the land of Israel ever since. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, Zechariah predicts that Jerusalem will be made a cup of trembling to all the nations of the world. Every nation that burdens himself with it will be torn into pieces, is his language. Here's a city, it's not that large, it has no natural resources, no harbor, no river, no reason to be relevant in the, on the modern scene. It's important to whom? to a minority of the Jews, not all of them. To Islam, Islam had it for a thousand years and let it turn into rubble until they discovered it was important to the Jews. And then, of course, it became very important to Islam. To Christians, well, we like to visit there, but not to die for. So the whole idea that Jerusalem will be a burdensome stone to the entire world on its face seems absurd. And yet, as we look around today, as you're watching this video, the staff people in every major capital of every nation that's internationally relevant on the planet Earth are struggling as to what posture to take, how to deal with what the intelligence people call the struggle for Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 12, God said, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. You couldn't believe that. 2,500 years ago, Jerusalem lay in ruins, surrounded by wilderness. And God said, let me tell you something. The day is coming when a world of 5.75 billion people will have their eyes on Jerusalem in fear and trembling, knowing that the next world war, when it breaks out, is going to break out over that city. And it's a little nothing place. You can't explain it logically, rationally. Even Israel's significance as a religious site does not explain the world's focus on this tiny nation. Because if we compare the annual number of tourists visiting Israel versus the annual number visiting just one Marian shrine in Lourdes, France, we see that more tourists visit a single shrine than visit the entire nation of Israel. I would say the next nuclear war could break out somewhere in the Middle East because um, the differences there are ancient and religious. I personally don't think they'll ever get it resolved there with, between the Palestinians and Israelis. Uh, and um, I think it's a no-win situation. I don't know why Hitler was so hateful of them. I mean, he... I, I honestly really don't understand that. I think those people who hate Jews and all that stuff are... Uh, I think they're afraid of them. I think that the Jewish people have had a bad rap for a long time. Twenty-five hundred years ago, the prophet Jeremiah said, I will deliver them to trouble among the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, a reproach among the nations. Look how Israel is standing alone. 
The Lord said, though the whole world be gathered together against them. Verse 37 in Deuteronomy 28, you get anti-Semitism. Many other verses. Israel, you're going to be hated, persecuted, killed like no other people. There's a lot of minority groups that think they've been oppressed and uh, dealt with harshly. Nobody like Israel. And we don't have time to give you the examples, but it's anti-Semitism is horrible. Visit Auschwitz. Do you know that after Auschwitz, after those skeletal survivors of Auschwitz were released, 1,500 of them were killed by the Poles when they went back to try to reclaim the homes from which the Gestapo had taken them to exterminate them. That's after the Holocaust. Six million perished at the hands of the Nazis. <laughs> Israel fighting for its survival against combined Arab forces. Bilo has been unable to stop radical Palestinians from attacking and killing Israelis. Anti-Semitism continues to this day. God foretold it, but he said, a thousand Hitlers can't wipe you out. I'm going to preserve you as an identifiable ethnic national group of people because in the last days I'm going to bring you back into your land. The prophet Isaiah said that they that come of Jacob would blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. The nation of Israel has now become the third largest exporter of fruit in the world. God spoke to the mountains of Israel and said they would be planted again, they would be tilled, the land would be sown, and this land that had become so barren would become fruitful and like the Garden of Eden. God said, I will do it. He did it. You go to Israel today and you see the fields covered with grain, covered with trees, and you realize God has done it. Let's take a look at, a, at another interesting verse. Way back in the Old Testament, Isaiah 27, verse 6, quote, Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit." <laughs> Unquote. I mean, this was wilderness until a very few years ago. It was uninhabited and it seemed to be uninhabitable. Go to Israel today. The forests that they've planted have brought in increasing rainfall and Joel 2 verse 23 foretold that. Israel sells flowers to Holland. That's astonishing. I mean, exactly what these scriptures foretold is happening in our day. And you go there and Israel is blossoming like a bud. According to Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics, Israel has significantly increased irrigation in the land during our current generation. Even from space, the once desolate nation of Israel is now lush with vegetation. In stark contrast, the surrounding nations are mostly barren. From many passages of scripture in the Bible concerning the future, prophecies that regard the nation of Israel, we realize that the temple must be rebuilt in order for these prophecies to be fulfilled. It is interesting to note that the Jews are very interested in the rebuilding of their temple. There have been several groups that have formed with the intent of the rebuilding of the temple. Already they are making instruments to be used in the temple for the sacrifices and for the temple worship. And uh, you can go to Jerusalem today and you can see some of the furniture and utensils uh, that have already been made according to the Levitical law. One of the next things to take place will be the rebuilding of the temple. How do we know? Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to it. And of course the interesting news out of Israel is they are preparing to rebuild. The Temple Institute has fabricated 63 of the 103 implements to be used in the temple. There are several hundred young men being trained to serve as priests in the temple. Scientists are in earnest 
uh, searching out the remaining loose ends, not the least of which is the precise location of the temple. There's something in the Israeli soul uh, about this temple. They already have the plans, they've got the stones, they've got the instruments, they've got the robes and so forth. They're ready to go and the temple will indeed be rebuilt. And the Antichrist is the one who will allow this to happen. Several Bible verses confirm that the Jewish temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem during the final days. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 1 we read, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. God foretold all of this, and this is the great sign. You say, does God exist? How do I know God exists? Israel. Take a look. Exactly what he said would happen has happened. You can't be an atheist. You can't be an agnostic. Nobody can deny it. These are the facts. It's happened before our very eyes. And of course, there's more yet to come. And because what he foretold has already happened, we have every confidence that what he says is yet to happen will indeed happen exactly as the Bible says. In this segment, we're going to look at Bible prophecy concerning a one world system, political and religious, that will be necessary for man to survive. According to the Bible, in the last days, all of the world will be gathered together in sort of a global community ruled by this one man empowered by Satan known as the beast or the Antichrist or the man of sin or the son of perdition in Revelation chapter 13 we read and all the world marveled and followed the beast so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now the Bible has indicated that at the end times, as, as it calls it, there's going to be a global leader rise. And he's going to be the most attractive guy the world has ever seen. The world is going to embrace him. And incidentally, he's a man of peace. He's a financial guy, not a military guy. He becomes very militarily powerful, so that who can make war with him is the cry. In 1995, hundreds of political, business, and religious leaders joined together in San Francisco for the first annual State of the World Forum. Their mission statement is to build the first global civilization. Proposals included creating a common language, creating a single currency, and uniting and accepting all religions. One of the religious leaders said, the universe is seeking to fulfill itself through us. As we study world events, we must conclude that the world is working towards a new world order. It's interesting as you examine what's going on in each country, not just in America, but also in the major countries of Europe, there seems to be a hidden agenda being followed towards a global socialist centralized government. We see that trend in this country. The Bush administration made that quite clear. The current administration is also clearly marching to that agenda. We see in uh, Britain, France, Germany, the politicians uh, are subverting their own national interests towards a dream of a one world government. There's lots of reasons for that. The idealists believe it may be the best for the environment and for the earth. Uh, others point out that the real driving force, probably, is nuclear proliferation. Now the world is heading uh, for disaster, and as you grapple with these issues, the conclusion you come to is the only answer is global supervision. Most of the leadership in the world is pursuing an agenda that presumes that there's going to have to be a single administration of the planet Earth. And the challenge before mankind is how do you get there nonviolently? I think everybody realizes we're heading for a one world government. Uh, you have to. We, we've got to get rid of wars, rivalry between nations, but we're also heading for a one world religion. You have to. 
Most of the wars, even right now on this earth, uh, are between religious factions, tribal factions. So we've got to have a one world religion as well as a, a one world government. The, the two uh, fit together. Now that we have an ecumenical movement uh, moving us in that direction and that the Pope is the leader of it can't be denied. The whole world is interconnected. It's not one country off by themselves and another country off by themselves that between trade, travel, um, interdependence to make, to survive in this earth, that it's going to, sooner or later, people are going to have to realize they have to work together. Um, from what I see, the Pope is trying to uh, get people to realize the problems that they have are individually superficial and that a more of a greater worldview should be more expressed. The Pope's main drive, I think, um, today is uh, would like world peace and I think you know one ultimate religion. In 1986 at Assisi, Italy, Pope John Paul invited 130 leaders of the world's major religions to join together to pray for peace. This world day of prayer for peace, to which you have come from many parts of the world, kindly accepting our invitation. Praying together were Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, witch doctors, and even spiritists. The Pope has aggressively sought common ground and unity between people of all faiths. The Bible also alludes to the leadership of the city of Rome, especially in an ecclesiastical sense, and the rise of the Vatican in a role to be a leader of an ecumenical movement sounds absurd if you've studied the narrowness and the folk and the conservativeness, if you will, of, of Catholicism over the last thousand, fifteen hundred years, what have you, to predict that Rome would be a leader in the New Age sense or in the pantheistic sense sounds manifestly absurd. And yet, as we watch day to day, the Vatican embracing evolution, you've got to be kidding. And there it is. So the point is, the more you study these major themes in the Bible, and the more you take the trouble to try to get the horizon, the world horizon in perspective, the more it seems we are heading right into that period that the Bible has so much to say about. And of course, all of this climaxes with this bizarre idea that Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe that became man and fulfilled a destiny on our behalf, is going to return to straighten this mess out. I believe that we are living in the most significant days of history that this world has ever known. And that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled and the return of Jesus Christ is at hand. This is a time to make a decision. This is a time to acknowledge and accept who God is and what He has done. We've been talking about signs of the second coming of Jesus Christ. He said in Luke's Gospel, when you see these things begin to come to pass, then you look up and lift up your head for your redemption is drawing nigh. He didn't say when they're fulfilled, all complete, but when they begin to come to pass, it's time for us to look up and lift up our heads. If ever there was a time when we need to be looking for the return of Jesus Christ, it is now. I believe that we're being plunged into that period of time about which the Bible says more than any other period of time of history for the following reasons. As we study the Bible, there are probably about a dozen major themes of prophecy. There's a whole theme about the nation Israel, the city of Jerusalem, the temple. There's a whole theme about Babylon. And we see Babylon re-emerging in world history. Saddam Hussein has spent 25 years rebuilding Babylon, over a billion dollars. There's a whole theme about Magog, that is Russia and its allies invading Israel. There's a whole background there. While all this is going on, the re-emergence of a European superstate, a move towards global religion. While all this is going on, a move towards global government. As you look at each of these themes, it isn't one of them. It's every one of them are being positioned before our very eyes, and uniquely so. 
For many years of my life, I had embraced a worldview that was based on humanistic ideas. But one day I came to the realization that what the Bible had to say, not only about the past, but the present and the future, actually made sense. And it agreed with the things that I could see, the observable evidence. And I have discovered that God's word, the Bible, is the truth, and we can rely upon it, we can believe in it, we can trust every word. Of all of the books in the world, the Bible is certainly the most unique book. It is the only book that dares to place its whole credence upon the fact that it is able to tell in advance things that are going to take place. No other religious book would dare to make predictions of the future and then base its veracity upon those things happening. And yet the Bible, not just one prediction, hundreds of predictions. The great discovery today is the discovery that these 66 books that we call the Bible, although they were penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years, we now discover they are an integrated message system. And what I mean by that is we now discover that every number, every place name, the very details of the text are there by careful engineering and yet they transcend time itself. A lot of people look at the book of Revelation and Bible prophecy as a message of gloom and doom, but the Bible message is a message of hope, a message of salvation, a message of turning to God, the one who created the heavens and the earth, and that we can have a relationship with him that will last for eternity. The gospel is the good news. At this point, <laughs> You might be thinking, I mean, it's a pretty hopeless scenario that's stretching out before us. The destruction that's coming, I don't think anybody can deny it. How am I going to escape? Well, Jesus is going to take you out of here. But, you know, I, I don't want to try to persuade you to come to Jesus as a fire escape uh, from the judgment on this earth or from hell to heaven. You're going to have to have better reasons than that. You come to him because this is the truth because you're guilty and because you want God to be vindicated and you want to get back in touch with God and be in line with his will you know God has great plans for this universe and you want to be part of that and you want God to be God and to have his way in your life and in this universe then you accept the pardon that he's offered for your sins and you open your heart to Jesus and you're on your way. With all these things that we have just seen, is there hope? You may be wondering, is there hope? Is mankind going to annihilate himself? Are there answers? Well, Jesus said that if he didn't return, man would annihilate himself, that no human flesh could survive. But the blessed hope is Jesus Christ himself. He is coming again. He is going to establish a kingdom on this earth. There will be righteousness and peace and joy and love and harmony with mankind. Jesus said that when these things begin to take place, that we could look up. We could have hope because the Lord was coming, the Redeemer was coming to take his own to himself. You might say, well, how can I be sure that Jesus Christ will take me? Does he love me? Well, the Bible declares that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the saving knowledge of His Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And I have good news for you. There's a wonderful new age coming, and Jesus Christ is going to usher it in, not man. And you can be part of it if you'll put your trust and your faith and your hope in God's Son, the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ at this time. You decide, open your heart, consider these things, and realize how much God loves you and the plan of salvation and the purpose He has in your life. Come just as you are. Hear the Spirit. Just as you
Don't you hear the spirit?